So, herzlich willkommen im Cartoon Museum Basel. Eine völlig neue Konstellation heute auf Zoom, aber immerhin können ganz viele Personen teilnehmen. Man sieht sich gegenseitig. Ich möchte ganz herzlich willkommen heißen. I would like to welcome Posey Simmons and Paul Claret from London. I'm very happy that you are here. I'm very happy that you are part of our conversation before the great evening starts and the opening of the exhibition of Posey Simmons. I would like to welcome next to me Kathi Rickenbach. Kathi Rickenbach, who is working as a comics artist. She uh, was publishing several graphic novels. But she was also working for the <laughs> press a long time. She's well known for her um, comic strip series, which was called Eine Baslerin in Zurich, a Baselin people living in Zurich. And she is, today she is here because we are talking about, she is, she is part of um, a group who was funding a new uh, union. institution, a union, a labor union, which is called Syndicon. Next to me is Patrick McCollo. He is uh, a journalist, he's a historian, and he knows best the journalistic world. He know, who knows what is going on, on nowadays. We were just cooperating and had this project from Corona gezeichnet. During the Corona crisis, he gave, or this was his idea, to give uh, comics artists the possibility to publish each week uh, a comic about the actual situation. Posey Simmons has been working for over 50 years for the press, not only for the press, she was published in graphic novels. He knows the field, the comic field, the cartoon fields, the caricature field, because London or England does have this long experience in drawing and in several uh, parts uh, which belongs to these fields. Paul Crefet, he knows the comic scene the best. He <laughs> is uh, publishing since the 80s. He's not only publishing as a journalist, he's also writing books like uh, main literature about comics, and he was publishing a monographic book about Posey Simmons. He is following Posey Simmons' fantastic artistic work since her beginnings. So, have a nice start in the evening and stay until 6.30, then it's, we will open the exhibition of Posey. And I give the word to Patrick McCauley. Thank you, Annette. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to you two in London. I'm very happy to guide you through this kind of hybrid hour um, between real presence and um, um, presence on Zoom. Um, Annette has told you that I'm a journalist. I'm not so much an expert in cartoons or, uh, or comics, but of course I, I try to kind of understand what's, what's going on in this field, also um, especially in the field of, of, of press and, and comic and, um, um, and newspapers and comics. So my first quest question to you, Mrs. Simmons, is when you started off with The Guardian, let's say a few years ago, many years ago, what kind of situation did you, did you find there? Is it, um, did they welcome you with open arms? <laughs> Were they skeptical about what you did? Or what, what, was, what was the situation back then in London? Um, I, I think my first uh, commission from the Guardian was about 1972. And I went in person to the paper, uh, to their features department, because I knew they used a lot of illustration. And uh, I saw the features editor who immediately gave me uh, an article to illustrate. He said it's uh, about um, four columns wide and so many uh, <laughs> centimeters deep, and we need it by 4.30. Okay, and so I ran away with it. And uh, because I lived quite near the paper, I, I did the drawing, I went back to the uh, paper and gave it to the editor. Uh, because it, of course in those days, there were, there was, you couldn't scan a drawing, uh, you had to deliver it in person, or sometimes post it. Uh, so it was all, all um, 
Uh, so you met a lot of people, you mm. met a lot of journalists. Um, when I, often when I delivered uh, my drawing, I would go to, in a big room, which was full of uh, people, journalists behind typewriters, <laughs> and typewriters are low enough for uh, people I knew on the paper, after I'd seen the editor, uh, to make s drinking signs like, are you coming to the pub now? <laughs> <laughs> so this is, as, this is as personal as it could get, uh, yeah. compared to, let's say, nowadays. I mean, you, could, you can deliver your drawings via your computer, or how, how do you do yeah. it nowadays? Do you know any, any editors in, pers in person um, still? Uh, no, um, <laughs> partly because um, I'm so old that all the people I really knew well are now my age, or they've retired. I know, I know a couple of people still on the paper, but um, now uh, when I work for them, um, I scan my drawings and, it, and it's sent um, uh, by Dropbox. So, yes, yeah, so I, I, miss, I miss that uh, communal feeling of the newspaper office. Does, does it make your work more difficult that way because you don't have direct contact anymore? Is it, or is it, um, in a way, makes, does it make it even easier because you're not under personal restrictions or whatever or, or content-wise? Um, does it have well, any, any inclination on your, on, your, on your work, on the content of your work? I, I have to say that I, I only work now occasionally for, yes. uh, for The Guardian. Yes. And so it, it's usually uh, an editor who would ring me up and say, you know, would you do that? And I like to have quite a good talk beforehand to find out exactly what they want and, uh, uh, you know, to repeat the format and, uh, and also the context for the drawing. Will it be surrounded by lots of articles and things? Because in a, on a newspaper page, it's often very busy, so you have to make your drawing stand out. Um, I mean, that's what, uh, it, when I was working for The Guardian in the 70s and 80s uh, and 90s, um, the space I was given was really half a page, <laughs> almost half a page. Um, I did have uh, two advertisements which accompanied my whole, that whole time. And one of them was for a, a particular pair of pajamas, which were very cosy in winter. They were called cosy pajamas. <laughs> and the other one um, was for uh, a, a sort of, um, uh, well, a sort of socks that you wear in bed on winter nights. So it, I was in this very strange company. Were, were you ever asked to incorporate cosy pajamas uh, into the strip as a bit of advertising or product placement? Was that <laughs> suggested? No, it was well, not. Well, I well, thought... An opportunity there, I think. I think being next <laughs> to Cozy Jamas for years was enough. <laughs> Pro product placement brings me to the next question. How, how, how about your freedom to work on certain topics? Um, were you ever kind of not forced to, but maybe... Um, was there any Could intention of, uh, uh, from the editors to... to put your content in a, in a certain, let's say, ideological or po political way? Or I think you're, I, were you always free, totally free? I was always free to a certain extent. I mean, my brief, when um, I was first started doing the strip in 1977, uh, was to do this strip, which somehow reflected the readership of The Guardian. Mm which um, is and was a kind of center left. And uh, my cartoon also appeared on the women's page, which had been a great forerunner for feminist writing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the other papers in Britain soon caught up, but for a time it was The Guardian that really discussed all kinds of things uh, from equal pay to, um, uh, reform and divorce and things like that. Um, so I, it was, I was free to um, choose the subject each week. Sometimes they would say, 
uh, Mayalisa would say, this week we're doing something, say, on divorce, and maybe you could <laughs> echo, echo that and, and um, do mm -hmm. something on divorce. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only time I was really censored, and this was right at the beginning of, uh, uh, sort of in the early years, was um, a bad language. Mm -hmm. um, so the F word, or, or... <laughs> uh, well, F word would certainly not. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was things like actually, if you blasphemed and you had someone say, "Oh God," um, <laughs> that was you know, so. That in 1977, they were a bit sort of uh, worried about "Oh Gods," and so okay. I used to. Uh, I had a couple of characters who, uh, boys June, Julian and Jolly, who all their conversation was swearing, but because I. I did it with stars and <laughs> asterisks and <laughs> exclamation marks. Um, people could sort of work out the the filth that they were saying, but um, <laughs> the editors, it was all right, the editors. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Very occasionally, uh, I, I would be, be told, uh, could you, you know, uh, do something... Uh, I don't know, a Christmassy or particularly at Christmas, they, mm -hmm. or if there'd been some, some weeks which were particularly dispiriting with news, they said, oh, can, could you do a, a lighter, <laughs> yes, a lighter piece. Um, before I quickly switch to the Swiss scene, so to speak, Paul, you have a certain overview over, over time as well, over the um, cartoonist and illustrationist um, um, scene in England. Um, when you look back and compare it to nowadays, is, is there a certain um, difference in maybe quantity of talented people or are the chances less that they can publish things? Or how would you describe a change over the last decades? Mm, well, I would say um, it's, there's no shortage of talent. That's absolutely for sure. And um, I would even perhaps suggest that there's more uh, nowadays, uh, certainly more talent. But their outlets, clearly, if we're talking about um, print and in press, uh, as, in, as in magazines and newspapers, mm. those, are, those haven't necessarily increased. As we all know, it's so much has moved on online now, and there are so many people are working directly in, uh, in graphic novels and not doing the kind of press journalism approach okay. that, that Posey began with at The Guardian. Mm. Uh, so that would be a, a big, big difference. And also, of course, I would say that um, the market now is much more joined up. I mean, Posey's work in The Guardian really wasn't seen anywhere else but in the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was put into books subsequently, but it didn't have a, an international profile and following, really. And whereas uh, now the graphic novels world is so, so interconnected that um, artists can find their works being published in several languages quite quickly. Um, and of course, obviously, read uh, online or all over the world. So that's an enormous uh, difference. So you wouldn't you wouldn't recommend to a young talent to go to a newspaper to try to get their first works published there? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Well, how tenure is the word? I don't know how you put it, mm. but in other words, contracts. We know that some people, the great Steve Bell drawing in The Guardian, mm. the same paper where Posey has, has got a, uh, is, he's not just doing it week by week, he's doing it because he's got a, a very well-paid contract because the newspapers know his cartooning is going to bring the readers in every day to see his viewpoint, whether in his big strips or his big, sorry, his big cartoons or the newspaper strip, if. And, and really, you won't get in there until... Well, probably till somebody until he passes away, which obviously hopes is, is is years to come, or perhaps if someone takes a contract out. I mean, if you were um, prepared to get him assassinated, then maybe you have a chance to take it in. But not to be this is being a bit rude. But basically, there aren't there are only so many openings, mm. and um, the only hope maybe sometimes is when a new editor comes in yes. and they want to shake things up a bit, yes, yes. Um, or maybe when a cartoonist retires. This is the only reason Posey got in in the first place with her big strips was because the previous artists, I think, went off on a holiday no. and they also thought, well, well maybe we'll, we'll try somebody else. <laughs> and she mm. got the gig um, and took his place. So there are a lot, uh, of, a lot of chance, not only talent, but also 
to be there at the right time in the in the in the right place in the right moment. Um, yes, actually, yeah. I can oh, take over that directly because my very hmm. first paid comic job was uh, when Mike von Audenhove, uh, Swiss famous uh, cartoonist of the Zurich Tip, which is basically the Time Out magazine of the Tagesanzeige, hmm. which is one of the biggest um, Swiss print. Uh, no, newspapers, Swiss newspapers yes. as you can yeah. say. Mm, yeah. Well, he went on a sabbatical, and then uh, I think it was a uh, half a year, and then I got the chance uh, with my column, with my uh, it was a full page in full color, uh, wow. to tell my stories about a Basler in, in Zurich, someone from Basel who came to Zurich. It was called Ziri, written with a Y, yes. because yes, people from Basel would spell Zurich like this. And this worked pretty well because of this uh, folkloristic rivalry between the two towns of Basel and Zurich. And I did basically, I did come from art school, I just moved to Zurich and I could do every week full page of autobiographical or let's say autobiofictional comics about my life in the town. And it was so easy also mm -hmm. to provocate reactions because all I have to do is to draw a story about football. And then people were uh, draw, uh, writing busy letters because it was time before social media. So, and but for someone who's not catching someone in a sabbatical or replacing someone <laughs> in a sabbatical, yeah. how's, how's, how's the situation in Switzerland? I mean, we have less and less um, um, papers, I would say, less and less maybe. Mm -hmm possibilities to publish um, um, comic or cartoon strips in papers. Is it, mm. are there too many people for too few occasions to, to publish or how would you describe the I, situation over here? Okay, I can tell it from my yes. own experience. So after the sabbatical, Mike von Audenhofer came back and continued his comic strip. And oh. then unfortunately, unexpectedly, he died and uh, Andreas Geffe took over for how long? a year or two years, and then it was dropped, finally. So that was the first important comic which got dropped. And then 12 years later, so I've got an unexpected comeback at the Tagesanzeige itself, this time the newspaper. And there was this um, Eva comic strip. I don't know if you know it, Paul. It's uh, uh, probably <laughs> Switzerland's most famous uh, daily comic strip appearing in a okay. newspaper, and they did it for 20 years. I mean, 20 oh, years yeah. daily comic strip. This is simply crazy. So uh, no wonder they wanted to drop it at some point. And the newspaper, it, they launched a competition yes. to replace that daily strip with six different weekly strips. So you have to imagine... Uh, for the audience, this was quite challenging because it, it used to be a daily strip. Now suddenly they had every day a different story, a different atmosphere, different characters, different heroes, different jokes. So it took, I think, half a year uh, until it was settled a little bit. And then after two years, they just shut it down. They kept one story and... This is, I just say that as an example how it's working. So they kept this one story, they put it on Saturdays within a little corner of the newspapers. And uh, it was, in the beginning, we had uh, like six to nine panels, and then it was three panels. And the panels were not only, they were under each other instead of next to each other. Vertical. So, yes. <laughs> This is the Japanese situation. style, that's strange. Wow. That's very strange indeed. And so after a while, um, they cancelled it secretly and quietly. And now at the moment, as far as I can tell, we don't have any comic strips yeah. exclusively drawn by a Swiss cartoonist at the moment. That, that, was, that was my intention to get in that direction yes. because you also, Annette mentioned it in her introduction, you, you, you kind of try to get better um, also um, money um, things for, for your, for your, for your um, profession in, in joining a union which should try to, to make a better yes. living for you. Th yes. This means your life is, your income is quite hard to get. Yes, uh, when you, when you, when you want to draw uh, comic strips in the newspapers, I would mm. say it is impossible, but I would be very interesting in talking about money so I can tell you the first time I did this uh, tip, my very first paid comic job in 2006, I got 1,000 francs for one full page 
comic, which made a good salary in the end of the month. I had uh, 4,000 francs, which is about 3,200 pounds. <laughs> is this about the same as you would get in <laughs> England? You don't have to <laughs> you can go say into too yes much or detail. No, <laughs> but I'm just curious, because I think it's so important to talk about money, mm. even though for Swiss people it's extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> So this was a question to, <laughs> to you, Posey. How much do you earn a year? Can you, can no, you? no. <laughs> how much do you earn? Or the, how much did the prices change during, you know, from the, the 70s? The, the weekly strips, yes. Uh, my, my first job uh, ever, which I did in 1968, uh, was uh, because after I left college, I did what everybody did. In those days, you took your portfolio around all the newspapers, all the publishers, mm. and you tried to see the art director in, in uh, person. And you wrote your name down on a little scrap of paper, and then you, then you left. Um, and one day, my phone rang. Uh, I was uh, very, very poor. I was, um, what was that? I was walking people's dogs, I was cleaning house, um, I was uh, look, I was babysitting. Anyway, one day the phone rang, it was the Times, and uh, they said, can you come into the office? Because we've, uh, the illustrator who usually does things is ill. So mm -hmm. I went in the office and they said, here, can you do us five cartoons now? Uh, we really need them, you know, in about an hour. And so I was really trembling. Um, and, and, the, and the piece I was uh, illustrating was very boring. It was about um, insulation for the, your loft, for the top of your house. So full of, full of jokes, right? Um, and, for, and for that, I was paid five pounds. What? For all the cartoons, not, that's just one lump sum for the lot. Yes, so, five, uh, so a pound, one pound each. But I have to say, in those days, I was living in central London uh, with five other people, and my rent was only three pounds a week. <laughs> that's so it's quite... Two pounds <laughs> good. It's, it's more money than it uh, sounds like. Uh, let me maybe quickly um, switch topic again and come back to to content. Um, what I'm interested in is um, you started in the early 70s in a very politically um, engaged uh, newspaper and in a time where ideologies were strong, you, you had labor governments, um, England was kind of going to bits, unions were very strong, etc., etc., um, in the 70s and then then it changed, we know it all, everyone knows it to Thatcher and etc., and mm -hmm. new labor. So. You oversee uh, 40 years of, of political change and so, um, um, social changes, and you have to reflect them in your in your drawings and in your in your illustrations and cartoons. And but somehow, when I look at I look at some of your works, um, some topics remain. They they have remained over the years. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you kind of um, take this challenge to reflect topics that were actually on the top 40 years ago and still are, let's say, women's rights or racial, racial things. Um, how do you change these topics into something which is, looks like new again? Do you know what I mean? Uh, I, know, I know what you mean. I mean, it, it's, I think there are still many things to be said, you know, especially uh, on women's rights, which, of course, have um, advanced a bit gone back a bit and um, you know i think as i said to paul once when he asked me it what i thought would had happened uh, say to, for women i i said um i think things are better i think they're the same and i think they're worse <laughs> um, because uh it, some things are better uh, the pay is better there are openings uh, uh more openings for women you aren't expected to stop working when you marry, you know, that sort of thing, which was very much 
in the early 1970s, it was very much the case. You had to get your husband's permission to, to uh, sign contracts and things. So that sort of thing has changed. But I think um, uh, for women, they are still absolutely judged on the way they look and how old they are. Uh, and that, you know, I, I can't see that changing, although you hope it, hope it would. It, it, it would. But does your, uh, approach, does your approach in your work change towards that topic that never changes? Is this kind of a paradox? But, um, or are you still a, have the same approach um, 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 artist-wise? I think, I think it's because I'm doing different things now. Yes. I'm not, I, I, in other words, I'm not doing a weekly, a weekly strip, which very much uh, I reacted to uh, what was going on. Not always, but I, I like to, you know, it to be a sort of commentary. Uh, mm. It was like writing a little play, a little scene mm -hmm. um, e every week about something. Um, since I've been doing uh, graphic novels, uh, the first two were actually published in The Guardian as serials. Um, that's, they're very different um, yes. because they're, Obviously, it's a story. It's got a beginning and an end. But I still wanted uh, some of the thing, some of the issues. Um, they've got three female mm -hmm. uh, heroines, so I wanted uh, some of what was going on uh, to be reflected uh, in in the story. Um, Gemma Bovary is a an upgrade, not an upgrading, how could it be? Um, it's a retelling of uh, Flaubert's uh, mm -hmm. great novel, uh, Madame Bovary. Um, and I, I, I wanted it to be uh, contemporary. I wanted it, uh, Madame Bovary, to be, uh, to be English. Uh, be doing what people, English people were doing in the end of the 1990s, which was buying properties in Normandy and other parts of France. The Channel Tunnel had just opened. Uh, I, a lot of them, of course, people who went to follow their dreams in provincial France, of course, came to grief. So I want, I wanted an element of that. Mm. I also wanted. Uh, her to be in a way quite ordinary, um, not specially likable, but somehow what happened to her to um, to be affecting in some way. So, so your, your your artistic approach via a graphic novel has has changed things, and and but also what I what I find interesting, you, it's always well. Most of it, it's a middle class that interests you. I have the, I have the feeling it's not, it's not so much the, 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 the guys who live at one or the other end of, of society, but it's, it's this way you try to approach and, and get your messages uh, through via the, the ordinary middle class people. Or is it, is it wrong impression? It's, um, I think, I think middle class is often a sort of a rather, rather dirty word. <laughs> 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 you know, les bourges, les bourgeois. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, 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 and it's not it's not something that that you I think Paul will agree uh, that you know there's not a lot about the bourgeois in superheroes or um, no, not, 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 not a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, I think Bat probably Batman is fairly um, upper class. He's very, he's very wealthy. He's very wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but uh, but I wanted to reflect uh, uh, a society that I knew, and also that it was a society that many, uh, um, particularly when I was doing the strip, that many many people aspired to a kind of middle class life. That there was shops like Habitat. I don't know if you know it in. In Switzerland, but it sold kind of quite cheap, but but uh, really rather good, rather interesting contemporary <laughs> furniture, um, and it it sort of changed the look of things. I I wanted to reflect the fashions. I wanted to reflect the 
the intergenerational conflict between teenagers and, uh, and their parents, which certainly in the 70s, um, the 70s parents were quite green. They saved mm. oils. They, they drove in their, in their Citroen de chevaux. Um, whereas <laughs> their, uh, the, a lot of the children want, were Thatcher's children, and they wanted to go into the city of London and make lots and lots of money. Mm. Uh, so I, I wanted to reflect all these different things. Paul, when you look at the... Um the artistic scene in, in England, is it, do some of them still aspire to kind of change society? Or is it more like the ironic distance that everyone has at the moment? You know, we, we don't really want to get too close to, to, to things. We, we, stay, we stay a bit far and we, we take irony or sarcasm even as a, as a means to distance ourselves and we don't want to change things uh, um, really, you know, it's, it's, it's the way of the 2000s, etc. Do, do you have revolutionary cartoonists and, and illustrationists in, in, in England, as maybe in the uh, 60s or 70s? Well, I, in, in England now, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would hope and, and think that there are a lot, because <laughs> it's, I, I've never known a um, a worse time. I mean, it, uh, being parochial and, and, and thinking about the United Kingdom, I mean, you know, Brexit has, has been, uh, I think so far, a really big mistake. And, uh, and then, of course, there's been COVID and, mm. and uh, unspeakable things in Afghanistan at the moment. There are it, I think it's a really critical time, which is not to say that, of course, there were, you know, there have been very bad times in the last 20, mm. 30, 40 years. Mm. I mean, it, it goes on. But I do think now is, is a particularly bad time. There, as I'm speaking, there's a helicopter. I live in, in the city of London. As I'm speaking, there's a... Uh, an extinction rebellion. It's a, a climate um, protest going on uh, very near. <laughs> there are police helicopters. I don't know whether you can hear them, but they're circling, circling above. Um, so there's a lot, very serious stuff going mm. on about climate change here. And mm. I think that young people actually do want to change things. Mm. Mm -hmm. I agree completely with that. And um, there's a very good anthology coming out uh, uh, where are we? in October. It's called The Most Important Comic Book on Earth. <laughs> oh, that's not, good to know. <laughs> not a very pompous title, actually, because the <laughs> on Earth means on as in about or dealing yes. with the subject of our planet. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really impressive anthology. It's brought together a lot of very famous people, celebrities, but also a broad range of, of British uh, writers and artists in comics. and. Uh, it's going to be. It's. It's also. It's not. It's raising money to 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 um, prevent um, species uh, becoming extinct. It's mm. part of a charity, okay. a, a activist cause called um, Rewriting Extinction. And uh, really, so that's just one of many examples now that are going on. And also, I would say that we've got. I hope it's happening in Switzerland too. That we've got much more diversity of voices and viewpoints mm. getting through. Maybe not so much in the press, perhaps in the, in, mm. in our That's daily true. press, whatever our magazines, but certainly in online and in small press and in uh, other kinds of projects. Um, and there are much. There are many more initiatives to try and get uh, greater inclus inclusivity, essentially, mm -hmm. um, which is mm. something we desperately need. Much it's obviously extremely important that Posey was in there in the Guardian as pretty much the only woman cartoonist at, mm. at her time. I imagine Katy, you, there weren't many other women cartoonists um, uh, necessarily getting into print uh, regularly in Switzerland. And unfortunately, yes. that has changed. But there are still other uh, minorities, let's, let's mm. say, that are, mm. that are needed that we need to hear from. Yeah. Absolutely, and I, I was thinking, um, I really missed my comic strip uh, when the pandemic hit, because I really missed having, uh, I really, I am still missing that window uh, mm. to, to show an opinion or to, to have a comment, a uh, contemporary comment on how the situa situation is changing. And with all, with all these uh, oddities and with all the things you see, um, 
I mean, I could <clears throat> draw thousands of comics <laughs> <laughs> every day because I'm so inspired by by the everyday life, and especially now where there is so much change in our society. I think, yeah, generally, I would say newspapers should um, should be a little bit more brave and courageous and bring us cartoonists back in the newspapers and actually treat us like, uh, like people with an opinion, with an outside view, uh, as a commentary, mm. as an editorial contribution, more than just a, a joke or a punchline, you know, because our work is so much more than that. And here in Switzerland, unfortunately, we have a very common uh, preju 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 prejudice. Prejudice. Yeah. Prejudice. <laughs> and uh, you will love Paul and Posey, but still a lot of people think, oh, cartoonist, so you are drawing Mickey Mouse. <laughs> And then he's like, oh, no, not exciting. Well, you draw something for children, right? Oh, it's so funny. We also have comics on the loo. And yeah, um, yes. Um, <laughs> we are here at this, at this stage, fortunately. I was going to say, you're having said that about drawing Mickey Mouse. It still happens. It still uh, happens. Yes, it happened when I uh, graduated at art school and I told people, hey, I want to do comics. Then it happened a lot, but it got less, I have to say, fairly, it got less. I think, meanwhile, we have a, quite a good uh, comic forum. how to say that in English? Uh, uh, people... Support from the, from the, yes. from the state for uh, official... No, no, or I would from, say from also through a cartoon museum or yes. Fumetto yeah. or mm -hmm. thanks to Strapazin, this long time, our guard magazine, people realize that there are uh, different styles and different artists and different mm -hmm. stories, even though there are hardly no cartoons or comics in newspapers today. Mm -hmm. I have a uh, last question before I want to open it to, to questions um, um, from our audience. A question with, which is... Um, which seems important to me as someone who writes things, because I think there's a, there's a difference between writing online and writing on paper, on actual paper, for a paper. And because I, it strikes me that when people comment on social media, they're less cautious, um, less friendly, they're, they're quicker, they're not very well reflected um, 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 regularly, it, it's, it's harsher. It's, it's more dangerous, I think, in a way. Um, does it make a difference for you or for, for illustrators or cartoonists whether you write, whether you design or, or draw a thing only online, digitally, or whether you draw it for, uh, for actual paper? Is it, it, does this make a difference? Or do you treat um, the two things the same? Uh, can I answer one part of the question? I remember after my first... Um, comic job there. When the assignment was over, I went to the bureau of the redactor, of the editor, editor mm -hmm. and he had um, such a map full with letters. And he said, here, these are all the, um, like, böse, the bad, the bad mm. ugly letters people wrote about your comics. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow. Mm. And he looked at me and saw my reaction, and he said, I won't give you that. <laughs> I'm so thankful, actually. And I imagine today it's much harder because mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though people say the worst is to have no reaction at all to your strips. But is, is the design or the drawing different? Whether you, whether you do it just online digitally or whether you do it for a paper, do you have to be more careful? Um, if, if it remains on a paper and it doesn't disappear in the digital orbit, or is it... Does, oh, it's, that's me, that's for me. Um, <laughs> I have to say I've only ever really drawn on paper because yes. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a dinosaur and I need, <laughs> I need a very patient student to, to help me do, uh, do things on, um, online. It's not to say that when I was um, on the paper, I, I used to get they used to be called green ink letters, which were usually very abusive and um, uh, and went on for pages and pages. And, and some of them were completely, well, completely crazy. Um, I used to get a lot of letters. And nowadays? Uh, hmm? Nowadays? 
And nowadays I, I get emails mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, I get emails. But, but still very insulting one, ones, or are they, are they diff, do they differ in tone? Than the written they, reactions. They don't. They don't really. They they're usually asking questions. It's usually questions which um, very involved questions, which would take you about a day to answer. Because, <laughs> and, and the library and uh, you know because it's you know what did I think of the difference between so and so and so and so and. <laughs> is the influence of so-and-so. Um, <laughs> they're often very long uh, and involved. Um, and, uh, but I actually had a physical stalker when mm. I... Oh, no. You know what that... Yes. Uh, so by going into the newspaper, there was, there was a man who... Um, well, he used to write and say, I'm waiting for you. And it was really creepy, which you wouldn't get online so much. But you would, but online you get really creepy, um, insulting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tweets and and things. Okay, but but you got rid of that stalker in the meantime. Yes, he That's he good. just after a bit, I think he got bored. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much so far. I think um, there's a few very um, specialist people around. I think they would take, like to take the chance to ask questions to you or to you, Kati. Um, and I think we have a microphone as well and it's now open and please don't hesitate. You could also do it in German if you like and we try mm, to translate. Yes. Mm. Jana. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for all these <laughs> great, uh, great inputs. I, I have a question to you, Posey. Um, what do you know a Swiss cartoonist, or which Swiss cartoonists do you know? If so, uh, no, you have your back to me, and I I couldn't quite hear the the question. Do I have a? Do you do you know? Swiss cartoonists, or do you know any Swiss cartoonists, or do I know any Swiss cartoonists? I'm, I'm ashamed to say I don't, and I'm very. Uh, one of the things I wanted to, uh, if it had been possible to come to Basel, I hope to have met some. Uh, yes. It would have been, been wonderful, especially to meet well old, old and young ones, um, and. Uh, so I, 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 I don't, but Paul maybe does. <laughs> he yes. has to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one we, the one we, we have to mention, it, going back a long way, of course, is Rudolf Töpfer from Geneva, because he's Sorry. kind of like the, the, hailed as the inventor, anyway, pioneer of comics. Uh, and although we Brits will actually always argue that William Hogarth who Töpfer admired and uh, <laughs> emulated came before him. And uh, Töpfer, you'll be interested to know, maybe, maybe has just literally this year been inducted in America into their Hall of Fame. I say taken something like 250 years or something since he died. <laughs> but they have, oh yes, we forgot about him. Uh, and uh, so that's a step forward. But he's not, you know, he's, his work is not really internationally known. And in terms of current artists, there are lots and lots of great ones. And as Cathy mentioned, uh, Strapazine is a superb magazine, really, really excellent. Um, and not just for Swiss artists, but international. Amongst my favorites would definitely would be Thomas Ott, uh, <laughs> who does this scrape aboard uh, terrifying stories. Oh my God. Uh, a lot of them are wordless, and uh, he's got a very, very big following uh, internationally. So, yeah, but there's many, many others, of course. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Anyone else? Hello, what do you organize uh, the exhibition, Paul? With uh, what do you choose the drawing? On oh, yes. uh, what w you have all the choice. Uh, for the open is uh, is, uh, is all the place, and you choose what you want. Well, we work together very much. But what's on, maybe Posey, you'd like to explain the circumstances because um, most of your archive, apart from the works from the Guardian, um, as in the original. 
large weekly strips you can see uh, st are still in your hands. They're still, um, you're still the archivist of your own work, aren't you? I, know, I never threw anything away or, or in, the early, in the early days, my mother never threw any, well, she <laughs> threw a lot away, but she kept a lot of my early things. Um, so when we were, um, I mean, the COVID virus made life a bit difficult that we couldn't meet uh, legally for quite some time. And then uh, uh, Paul came to my apartment and we, we, we went through uh, lots and lots of folders. And then we, uh, we sent uh, images to Annette uh, at, at the uh, museum and and she sent back uh, her choice and and so it went on didn't it we sort of added we subtracted we um, ended up with a lot a lot I'm just amazed <laughs> there's over, over 300 so there's never this is the most comprehensive exhibition to date of, of your work isn't it Percy? That's been it, I, I'm it, I'm I'm overwhelmed by it yeah, yeah it's, it's tremendous and yet choosing it was very very difficult and I'm um, as a curator um I sh I'll be polite here shall I because but I'd be a bit cheeky because having having created quite a few exhibitions, it can be very nice, of course, to have a living artist to work with. <laughs> At the same time, as a curator, you have to also, also honour their wishes, and we didn't want to show anything that Posey wasn't happy with, but she's got so much good work. Mm -hmm. And I think, Posey, sometimes you're your own harshest critic, because there's <laughs> wonderful things to be found. And so, oh, no, I don't want to show it. And I go, well, <laughs> I mean, I might want to show it, Annette might want to, but of course, as the artiste, the great artiste you are, you have the final say, <laughs> as, as should be, as should be the case. I'm not, but I'm just pointing that out. Yeah. Uh, but there is a wealth of, of, of wonderful work in Posey's archives. And we were lucky in one respect that because of COVID, otherwise, much of your archives would have gone to the Victoria and Albert Museum, I think, and the Bodleian Library were both both going to be acquiring, so that would have been even more complicated. Fortunately, I could come to your apartment and we could go through it all together and find and find things that you hadn't seen for for for, for decades, possibly. Yeah, it was like archaeology. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are there any characters or stories, um, Posey, that you would like to forget, that you would never have liked to have drawn? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, there's several strips I did for The Guardian, I would, uh, yes, cheerfully like to, like to forget. Of course, in, <laughs> in those days, a strip was um, ephemeral, that you, ha you had it with the paper with your toast and marmalade for breakfast, and in the evening, the paper was put in the cat tray <laughs> or, you know, for fish and chips or, or just in the bin. So you're, you're, it was like a butterfly. Your, your drawing lasted a day. Mm. Yes, I, I, I remember once having bought some flowers and that it was wrapped in a newspaper with my comic yes. strip there. <laughs> with your fun. drawing on it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, but, you know, like from three weeks ago. From yes. this trip. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> are, or are there, on, on the other hand, are there any characters that you favour when you look back, when you do your archaeology in your own work? Do you think this, um, this one has been, wow, my masterpiece or a character which I can identify with mostly? Yeah, I, I suppose the, the, I suppose it's the, the book or the serial, I mean, I mean the first one I did which was Gemma Bovary. Um, it was so difficult to do, and it was done under a, a lot of pressure in that it appeared every day in the paper, and it was hmm. quite a, a, a big panel. Um, and as I made the mistake of uh, thinking I would be like Charles Dickens and just start it, have a few um, ready, and then I would sort of get on the back of it, 
and uh, and draw it as uh, you know as it developed. Um, unfortunately, my rate of drawing wasn't quite as quick as I would like, so I got I got behind. And uh, <laughs> when I was hot, well, at the end, I was only about four days ahead, so it was a it was a quite a ride. But but it's, it was also like being on something kind of hatching. Uh, so it was it was kind of terrifying, but exciting at the same time. It, but, uh, um, it seems so like I, it seems I'm like you have. Fun. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It it seems like you have a kind of a Victorian uh, uh, discipline. When you mentioned <laughs> Dickens and all the Victorian novelists, they wrote uh, uh, novels after novel, and and you have to write a, a a strip every day, which is unimaginable for one who can't do it. Mm -hmm. it how do, how did you approach this? You, you started at seven in the morning to ten, and and then in the afternoon again. Or what, what, what's the yes. what's the secret? Um, when I when I was doing uh, Gemma Bovary, I I began with I'd done already about twenty five episodes, and mm -hmm. so I thought in a week I could probably produce two, and so mm -hmm. you know I would go ahead like that, um, but then I lost I lost some time, and. Uh, And also, as the thing went on, um, uh, the character changed. The character of Gemma Bovary changed. Mm -hmm. So that whereas I, I had written in my kind of timeline that like Flaubert's heroine, she would uh, um, commit suicide, not by rat poison, arsenic, <laughs> like Emma Bovary does, But she would take an overdose, and I'd written this uh, about episode 93 or or so. This this would happen as I got nearer and began to uh, make little sketches of the her taking an overdose with the pills and writing a letter to her husband and and kind of actually being found on the floor and things like that. Um, she wouldn't die. She she kept sitting up and saying, uh, "I'm sorry, I'm not doing this." Um, <laughs> it, just, it just wasn't convincing, and uh, I, was, I was sort of going die, and um, and then I realised, in fact, she, her character she wasn't a suicide. She would have re, re, she was somebody who would reinvent herself, um, and by that time in the book, I hope. You know, I hope she'd learnt a thing or two about herself, so that her life would be less, you know, less dependent on a on a rather awful man that she had been in love with. Um, anyway, so I, it, it ended up that I had to kill her rather than <laughs> herself. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Posey, as you're a kind of a role model to me. Uh, how do you how you, do you finance your books? I mean, you're in, seems you seem to be in a comfortable situation that you can uh, you earn with your strips, and then put your strips together in a graphic novel. So actually, the book is somehow paid, or how does it work? Um, well, the first uh, I think I think partly because I worked for a long time for the Guardian, so I was on a, a year's contract all the time. And so when the first two uh, graphic novels were commissioned as serials in the paper, that was that was really a contract. It oh. was to do uh, so many episodes, uh, Gemma Bovary, a hundred uh, every day. Uh, I mean, not a hundred every day, but a hundred. <laughs> one a day, and tomorrow hmm. Drew was two episodes a week in, yes. in, a, in a different uh, part of the paper. And, and so it was really a repetition of, of the contract that I was used to having with The Guardian. Um, then they became books, and, be, and I was lucky enough that then there were foreign editions hmm. And then two of them were made into films. So I've been lucky. I mean, they, so, uh, so each of these developments has meant that, and I, I don't go crazy, but it means it finances the next project. So, because uh, graphic novels are 
you know, they're quite a long-term project. And uh, yes, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, and they yes, and you need you need the money while you're doing them. Yeah, Good. this is like a, a dream situation that you got a contract from a newspaper paying you the episodes and you make a book out of it and you will gain even more money when you sell it to foreign editions. I think, wow, okay. stunned. <laughs> Do we have more questions from the audience? Everyone's <laughs> satisfied, tired, <laughs> bored to death. To <laughs> no? Well, I think we have our hour and it was a, a, a great pleasure and a new experience for me to do this and for you maybe too, to this hybrid situation. I hope um, mm -hmm. um, we were <laughs> happy about what we, what we could uh, uh, draw on. And, um, it's could I just ask Patrick, I mean, one, yes? because we've Go. got uh, Cathy here with this new um, union, I thought we might have covered a bit about Yes. A bit of the history, maybe, of, of the struggle of cartoonists to, to unionize and to get paid well. Um, but also, maybe also what's going on now uh, in the Swiss scene, and maybe we could pose like a comment about what's going on now in terms of are things any easier for the current and next generation of cartoonists? Because, um, you know, you have to, this, this, it's clearly, these are rapidly changing circumstances for cartoonists mm. to work in. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so Katy, could you just tell us a bit about what your hopes are with sing, with uh, yes. comms, what I, I think? Yeah. I mean, the reason why we founded this union, I think it's quite yeah. obvious, because um, I have colleagues in this Stoppertzin working space where I work, they are already for 40 years in the business and they keep telling me that the prices at the moment for illustrators, they are stagnating or even getting worse, especially in the print media sector. Mm -hmm. And um, we can see also now with the development of the online medias that there is a lot of violation of uh, licensing rights and actually you have no rights at all and nobody knows exactly how to charge uh, Nutzungsrechte rights and how to, how to deal with that and it's not taught at the art schools so far. So we founded this union in the middle of the pandemic actually that we can uh, uh, tell our colleagues about pricing and how to make uh, um, offerte. Yeah, mm. just how to deal in the business and uh, to mm. try mm. together to, to bring back um, some cartoon strips or comic strips in the newspapers, even though I think it's not possible because the media, they don't have money or they... Um, they pay very bad and often what I experience is that they treat comic strips as illustrations and I think uh, they don't value the, the text, a concept, conceptual work to build a story, especially on a longer run to build up characters and the atmosphere. And, mm. uh, it's just like uh, treated and paid like a simple illustration or a design. Um, yeah, this has to be changed. And mm -hmm. we're trying that by giving workshops and by talk to each other and the usual union things, I guess. And I assume, Katie, that you're in contact with equivalent unions. I know there is a um, yes. syndicate of authors in France, I believe. Exactly, and yes. also all ties in with the recent, there's been a spate of surveys, a big one, Les Etats Généraux yeah. bon, de Bon Dessiné in France, which was uh, unveiled at Angoulême Festival a few years ago, which mm -hmm revealed the dire circumstances of, of many authors who are, and we've had a similar thing here in the UK. We have, by the way, we have a, a, a UK comics laureate. I'm not sure what the term for laureate, maybe it's the same word. But in other words, um, Percy hasn't been the laureate yet. Uh, it's actually quite a demanding role, but our recent laureate, previous one was Hannah Berry. And yes. She was able to get um, Arts Council funding, so that's an important thing, to do a proper st a survey of the profession uh, across the whole spectrum from, uh, from very established artists to people that are working, you know, as a hobby, essentially. But it was just revealed uh, uh, just how much struggle there is for people to make it get paid, how this, um, you know, it's, this is often a, a vocation that doesn't pay. Um, and actually what's come out of that, interestingly, there are various initiatives. One of the best is that we have a society of authors here, and that's obviously meant to be proper authors who 
don't yeah. use pictures, <laughs> but just use words. Um, well, they very, very nicely have opened their doors, a little bit anyway, uh, to let cartoonists in and mm -hmm. comic artists, and they will then conjoin and get representation, get their contracts looked at. They, instead of having an agent, mm -hmm. um, which is what is the other option, of course, for cartoonists to be represented, and opposing you have an agent looking after your, your interests. Uh, for other cartoonists, comic artists, they can join the Society of Authors. Mm -hmm. But I think there needs to be, there could be a bit more joining up of these, these the surveys, the findings, the exactly. unions, the organizations of, of, of creators, so that there's more learning from each other, essentially. Exactly. Perhaps, uh, some kind of maybe even just a European cartoonist union or something. Yeah, and, that would be great, actually. I'm sure that I think that more connectivity would be beneficial because it's an issue that everyone's experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to mention, I have just one amusing story I just was dying to tell you about, but um, <laughs> Um, Sergio Aragonés is a Mexican comic artist mm -hmm. who you might know if you've ever mm -hmm. read Mad Magazine. He used to do the little marginal mm -hmm. initial cartoons in the margins. And I once attended a festival where he gave a presentation and he explained that when he first arrived in New York from Mexico, uh, he was, you know, obviously trying to get work. He discovered there were all these unions uh, in uh, New York um, because, of course, the Mexican word for, uni for, for union is sandica, as in syndicate. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> went, for example, to King Features Syndicate and went to the reception and said, Hello, comrades! We're all here to... But, uh, to yeah, I've, of course, got the completely wrong idea because King Features Syndicate was a newspaper <laughs> strip syndicate that was very commercial and certainly not in any way a union. Um, and I just I thought it was a marvellous example of misunderstanding. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to the serious point, it is... What you're doing with Syncom is very important and I'm sure you're aware there is uh, movements elsewhere that you could link up, basically, to and, and learn from and support each other. Yeah, yes. and it's also important that, you know, like we try to form a community and that we are in exchange also, as, as you mentioned, with authors, but also with filmmakers and movie makers. Mm. And we actually discovered that we have kind of the same problems. Yes. So it's always good. It's much it. more joined up now. Yes. Which, which is wonderful. Yes. Um, so that, I mean, my experience was from a small, really a small world of of uh, British newspapers and uh, and also the newspapers then were bigger, there was more space. Um, I have to say I, I wasn't paid hugely, I, I don't want you to think that I was, uh, you yeah. know, uh, I, in the end it worked out all right, but at the, the beginning, you know, I was, I was paid peanuts. Mm. Uh, but I, it, it's wonderful now that, that everything has come together and and particularly with the addition of online things. I mean, I, I look at a lot of those, I find them absolutely wonderful and a great way of getting your, getting work seen by a bigger audience. Yes or no, but it's, it's just so often not paid correctly, especially online format, especially, I mean, <laughs> there you are, in, in between this this conflict, should I do it for free so then I can get more reach, or should I say mm -hmm. should I ask for money? Should I take this very less money they offer me so at least I can do something? And as a as an artist, you always have this problem that you 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 would put all your artistic soul in something you will do, and if you can have reach or if you can be seen, you would do it also for a for a bad salary for once because your hopes are so big that <laughs> you really want to be seen, especially with young artists or illustrators. And I think mm. it's, it's interesting what's going on elsewhere. I mean, in South Korea, they have had a very interesting <laughs> revolution, which we're probably still going through now, where, where essentially print yes, ha yes, yes. has certainly journalistic print has, has pretty much disappeared. And everything is, is very, very online. As a result, comics, print comics disappeared as well. And they have this new format for the web called webtoons, which are these vertical scrolling yes. comics. Um, and they have major players in this field, and uh, which um, companies who are financing uh, cartoonists to make material, usually episodic serials, very addictive material, but often also quite excitingly, quite journalistically engaged stories, stories that deal with 
you know, societal issues, topics that sometimes maybe the, the, the big media doesn't talk about. Yeah, but um, there, that's, sorry, and, and sorry, they Paul. Can, they, can earn, they can earn quite a lot of money from each one of these um, you know, episodes on Webtoons, and clearly people are going to be reading newspapers and comics in this format. But sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but actually yeah. the system with these pages works like uh, the more people who uh, read your comic, the more you get paid. Actually, when you're not famous and nobody knows you, and you, I mean, everyone can probably upload their comics yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So it's based on the risk of an artist if you join in, and maybe sure, you are lucky, sure, and uh, sure. your story and is really good. There, and, and it's the whole question, question also of discoverability. That's yes. the, the, one of the buzzwords, is at least and, if you're on one of these big portals, then you have more chance of maybe reaching more people. So, I don't want to be rude, um, but oh, I think so I have to... Yeah, <laughs> oh, no, but no, you, no, can, no, you no, can do it, by, you can do it bilaterally later. Just one more. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to show you this. Look, look at these things. <laughs> look at this. This is a new magazine coming out of India in print, a print magazine called Comic Sense, and it is um, graphic, hang on a minute, yeah, graphic journalism. Now, we haven't used that term yet, yes, but that is exactly. something where newspapers and possibly people who like to write and are not maybe awfully comfortable with people coming in and doing drawings who maybe can write as well but this is where graphic journalism is another way that's mm. taking off we know in france there's la revue dessinée there's 21 there are great magazines doing the job of journalism but doing it and sometimes obviously with journalists not necessarily solo yes. Exactly. This is an enormous field, which if, if newspapers and media want to wake up, um, they should be thinking <laughs> of, of, of this as being a way to engage readers and not just we're going to run another you know, 25,000 word um, story which hardly anybody can read. I mean, that's a bit rude maybe, but um, mm -hmm. what do you think? Graphic journalism, have you, just may I ask you, person, has that ever appealed to you to, to take on a subject like that? I mean, you've done it in a way with your reportage pieces, haven't you? You've done reportage. Yes, reportage, which I enjoy doing. They had to do it very quickly. Yes, you're under a lot of deadline pressures, aren't well, you? Really? Yeah. I think the, the media of uh, picture and narration is also very good mm. to simplify and uh, cur um, certain topics and to explain yeah. it or tell them in an entertaining way. And like this, uh, you could also reach a different audience. Um, mm. It's not only Instagrammable or a valuable change, within text and photos. It's really, I think it really can open up for uh, new audiences. I think newspapers should mm -hmm. really check that out. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't have the money, the you know, that's the problem. <laughs> no, I think you wouldn't get the audience. That's a problem, but anyway. Um, yes, sorry, I have, to, I have to interrupt because we have to open the exhibition. Um, I'm sorry, um, but... On it, are you? It's okay? Good, good. It's a pity you couldn't join us for the upro to, to go on talking. I mean, it would be, would, be um, would be fine, but anyway. Thanks for joining us from, from England. I hope, hope you're doing fine, and thank you Patrick, very much. Patrick, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.